So I'd like to welcome first Alex Lum talking about the world of Wikipedia, or sorry, Wikidata. And let me get that up now. Thank you. So um, I'm sure I don't need to tell you what Wikipedia is, but uh, you might not know what Wikidata is. Um, you can probably tell from the name. Is it like Wikipedia but for data? So yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, no. <laughs> Thank you. No. Um, so Wikidata went live in 2012. It's a free and open knowledge base um, that can be read and edited by both humans and machines. So that's an important part of it. It's machine readable. Um, it's one of the sister, there's about 12 sister projects of the Wikimedia Foundation, of which Wikipedia is the best known, but there's also several others, including Wikidata, Wikivoyage, Wiktionary, Wikisource, and others. Wikidata contains about 67 million items, and I'll show you what an item is shortly, and about 5.8 billion triples, and I'll show you what they are. So um, Wikidata is essentially an RDF, Resource Description Format Database, or a triple store. Um, a triple is a data entity composed of a subject, predicate, and an object. So like these, these barbell diagrams. So in Wikidata, that can be an item, can be linked by a property to another item, or an item can have a qualifier, which links it to another item, or a property which links it to a value. Here's a more complicated diagram of that, uh, of the um, Wikidata schema. Uh, but I'll just show you through a basic, if you go to the website, which I haven't put anywhere on here, but it's wikidata.org, um, and you can get to it from any of the uh, Wikimedia um, sites. I've brought it Wellington here. So there's three parts I want to point out. The first thing you'll see at the top there is a label. There's also a description and a bunch of aliases. And you can also see um, the, these languages, I mean, the, sorry, the label, description, and uh, aliases in a variety of different languages. Uh, Wikidata has two kinds of statements, or two kinds of each item is will be one, two, one or one of these things, or sometimes both, but uh, generally not. Generally, it's one or the other of an instance. So that is something, uh, a, an item, a specific object that exists, or it can be a subclass, which is kind of uh, like a, an ontology tree, um, and it can be so you can have a city is a um, is a subclass of a human settlement, and so on, or a capital city is a subclass of a city, and so on. And you'll also see on Wikidata properties and items. So I mentioned those in the triple um, definition. Um, so uh, as I said, this is an item for the city of Wellington. Um, it's an instance of a capital city and an urban area, and it's linked to other items. So capital and urban area are also items in Wikidata, um, and they're subclasses of other things and so on. And so that's how it's all built out. And the last bits you'll want to see are the two types of uh, of statements um, and oh, sorry statements so are those ones where there's a property an item a property and another item of, or a value and identifiers so this is a very important part of wikidata identifiers which are the uh, the codes or ident or primary keys or identifiers that you'll find in in other data sets and a lot of these are linked um, there's thousands of them linked to from um, from wikidata which makes, those identifiers make Wikidata a very important part of the linked data web. So this is a, a diagram from this website, lod-cloud.net, uh, and where Wikidata, Wikidata is one of those little circles, but it joins to hundreds of other um, data sources or linked data sources um, via those identifiers. So that, that makes it a very powerful and important part of those because you can uh, link it to all, all sorts of other data sets. Language, Wikidata is very, very flexible when it comes to languages. So those labels and descriptions I showed you before and the aliases um, can be added for any language with an ISO 639-3 code. I looked up how many there were. There's like about 7,800. So that's quite a lot. Um, I'm not saying every item has all those languages filled out, of course, but uh, um, the possibility is there. And you can see Wiki Wikipedia uses those for these inter-wiki links. Or if you look at an article about something, the article about the same thing in a different language um, on the, on the left-hand side of the page, that is uh, uh, generated from Wikidata. Um, multilingual Wikidata labels can be used for many other things, uh, such as simple machine translation and even localised labelling for map tiles. 
uh, geospatially, um, it's, uh, we've got latitude, longitude points, administrative territories, and many others, including capitals. Uh, but the main advantage is the linking to everything um, in, in these internal data sets. Querying Wikidata, it's the delightfully named query language Sparkle, uh, which is an RDF query language for semantic data. Um, the, the Wikidata query service, where you can put in these Sparkle queries or use the visual editor builder. Uh, and, and there's also one for OpenStreetMap. Thanks very much, Alex. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so next up we have Andrew Harvey of Sydney, and he's going to be talking about practical mapping tips in OpenStreetMap. Hi everyone, so this is very much aimed um, kind of at beginners, but Hey, even if you're an expert in OpenStreetMap, um, you don't know everything, and hopefully um, you'll pick up a few tips. So first off, um, how do you actually map in OpenStreetMap? Uh, you can go out and do some field mapping. So you know, if you like to actually get outside, um, this is a great way to do field mapping. Uh, you can do it individually or with a team, group of people, um, organized mapping parties, a great way to do mapping um, and to help each other out. So, you know, you don't really need much equipment. You can go out there with pen and paper. This is exactly how I started, just printing off a map and just making notes on the pen and paper. Uh, but, you know, since then, things have evolved and we have uh, a few mobile apps, which um, there's, there's a lot of others out there, but here are just kind of a few that I've mentioned uh, that make it easier for you to contribute to OpenStreetMap. So, Street Complete, um, certainly go ahead and try that one out because it really makes it very easy to add in little bits of missing information. Uh, someone else might have added a sporting field, but they never set what type of sport is played there. So Street Complete, when you're walking past it, it will pop up and say what kind of sport is played here. It's very easy to contribute. Um, really great, great for, for kids as well. Um, and a few others, uh, Maps.me, great for adding points of interest, uh, OSM and also great for adding a whole bunch of uh, places to OpenStreetMap. Um, and then uh, Vespucci, sorry. I practiced that like an hour last night, but I still didn't get it. Uh, <laughs> that's also um, a great uh, app for Android that lets you go and add more detail to OpenStreetMap. So it's a bit harder to use, but uh, you can add in a lot more detail. Um, and then GoMap is also on iOS, which is a bit quite similar. And then uh, also still um, field mapping, you can do photo mapping. So with either um, Mapillary or OpenStreetCam, really great tools. Uh, you can set up either just with a phone or action cam uh, to go out and collect imagery. Both, uh, it's useful if you want to go back later and, and map features from that imagery, but also it's a great reference so that other people in the OpenStreetMap community who's maybe looking at a particular area, maybe someone has reported an issue, can go and ground truth that by looking at some recent uh, imagery. Uh, and then, of course, there's armchair mapping. So, you know, if you're really lazy and don't like to go outside, um, you can also contribute just sitting at your desk. Uh, you can use the ID editor. That's the default editor uh, when you go edit on the top of the OpenStreetMap webpage. Um, so you don't need to install any software, and you can map uh, a, a lot of detail and a lot of different types of features with ID. Um, and then if, you, uh, if you're like me and then you want to use a more advanced editor, uh, I'd certainly recommend Jossum. You can just install it on your desktop computer. Um, it works really fast and uh, you can go into a lot of detail. Um, and so in terms of data sources, you can use aerial imagery, open data, GPS traces, street level imagery, all these kinds of things um, are useful for OpenStreetMap mapping. So what to map? Certainly um, head to the wiki of OpenStreetMap, so just wiki.osm.org, and just search for the kinds of features that you're interested in mapping. Now, you'll be surprised, probably, um, anything that you can probably see outside, there's probably a wiki page or some kind of reference to it here about how to actually map it. So um, it's really great documentation about how to map different kinds of, of things. Uh, so certainly just go have a read because you'll be surprised. So it doesn't matter kind of what mode um, you are, you can map features and information, not just features, but information relevant for that mode. 
Um, and then lastly, validation. So a lot of people think about, okay, let's, let's map it in OpenStreetMap, but validation is also quite an important step. Um, it helps uh, to catch errors that maybe people make, um, and ge it generally helps improve the quality of the data. So OSM char is a really great tool for that. You can actually set an area or a region that you're interested in, um, and then you'll get alerts or uh, kind of changes that happen. Um, they'll pop up here, and you can actually go and look at that change. And you can go and see what they changed. You can see the description of what, what they changed, all the tag information. Um, and then uh, if you do notice an issue, uh, first I'd recommend to just add a change set comment. Um, and if you go to this website here, it's a great tool to see all the change set comments that are happening um, in any particular country. So you can also look at the Pacific Islands there. Uh, go to the mailing lists um, or Slack. Uh, there's a really great community resource there. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. So next up, we have Brent Wood, and he's going to be talking about a new paradigm in the visualization of species data. This was not done as a lightning talk, but I have done it in five minutes before. <laughs> so the goal, a web portal allowing users to interactively visualize data pertaining to, to modern fisheries surveys. These are very ecosystem approach, many species, many methods, a whole range of information available. And it's quite complicated, and the relationships between all these things is quite complicated, so we wanted a tool that would allow this to happen. Normally, if someone builds something like this, you have a complicated hierarchy of web pages from as you drill down through to find the information you want about the species you want and the sort of information about that species in its own page, etc. And you finish up getting lost in the maze. So we wanted this to do as much data as possible in as few pages as possible without the data turning into noise. We wanted to visualise comparisons between species distributions, interactive plots, species-centric views of data, and data-centric views of species. And the minimum number of pages you can have in a website... <laughs> that's the goal. Um, it does have tabs and pop-ups, so technically you can get picky about it. Um, very mouse-over driven, so the user's just moving the mouse to change the content, etc. There's the address for the prototype. It's actually working and has been quite successful. As you move the mouse over the graph, the species is highlighted, and you can see one species. You can click on a species to select it, and it will appear on the map. You can click on one of the columns of data for a data-driven view of all the species. And on that pop-up, you can click on the species to change the species again to a new current species. You can look at things like biomass trends with ranges. The map is showing both the species where it is found and where its absence is worse, or where it's not found, which is quite critical from a bio perspective. You can see the presence absence there in a bit more detail on that map. You can see multiple species and compare the distribution of different species on the map. And we still haven't changed the web page. So I'm going to do this in well less than five minutes. But the response from users so far has been essentially almost word for word in several cases. <coughs> wow, that's awesome. Um, it's new, it's different. and it's very much a work in progress. It's being for de developed for us by Catalyst IT, so thanks, Toby. <laughs> um, <laughs> I hope so, I'm paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's plotly D3 base for it, mostly. Um, any technical details, see Toby, not me. Um, but any other questions about it and sort of how we're doing it, it's, it's um, my email address is there.
So coming to the stage now, we have Caitlin Adams, and she's going to be talking about her first experiences with user experience design. Okay, so uh, this is not a guide to how to do UX design. It's a story of how we did a little bit of UX design. I'm learning more and more about this all the time, and I think it's amazing. Um, and given we're here talking about open source stuff, if you're not talking to your users, you should be. So the thing that I work on at Frontier SI, it's with Geoscience Australia, and it's called the Digital Earth Australia Sandbox. The idea is that you can log on, interact with code that you know, does all these really cool spatial things, and you can use that to learn about the Open Data Cube. And that's awesome. Um, and when I came on, it didn't have a lot in it, and so my job was to fill it full of really amazing remote sensing analysis. But I came on and I said, well, what actually needs to be in there? I don't know. I'm super new to all of this stuff. So the best thing I could think of to do was to start asking people. So we started with a really simple Google Forms survey, and this was just emailed out point blank to everybody on our mailing list, which I think was 600 people. And what we kind of discovered out of that was that people have a really wide variety of backgrounds. There were government, like people who heard of it who were in government or in industry, um, from the level of decision makers who wanted actionable insights to the people who were doing the technical work and that all of those different groups had a really wide variety of needs. And sort of the other thing we learned was that people had had a pretty small exposure to the sandbox. And that kind of tells you something. Um, but in order to understand it a bit more, we decided to kind of contact some of those people directly and say, well, would you be happy to talk to us about it? So we go to this user interview stage. We were sort of having short, you know, 30 minute conversations over Skype with these people. And we got to learn about what kinds of problems they're trying to solve. Um, but also we tried to ask them, well, how do you like to learn? We were trying to want understand whether the sandbox as this sort of demonstrative tool was the right thing. And from that, learning about that, we were able to talk directly and understand their sort of problems and needs. And really this sort of consistent problem emerged. The reason people weren't using the sandbox, the learning curve was too steep. There was no gentle introduction. It was too hard to get onto. Nobody really knew what it did, so nobody used it. And that was an amazing thing to learn because what it highlighted to us was we actually needed to build something else. So what we did was we sat down, this is me and Chris Morgan who's talking after me, and we said, well, what if we could make a really simple website that was user-focused, that provided the information people were actually looking for, and specifically, could we do that so that it addressed the needs of those decision makers who wanted to know whether they pers should pursue using Digital Earth Australia and the Open Data Cube through to the technical users who were going to have to install the thing and then directly work with it. And um, so once we sort of built a gentle sort of prototype, we went into user testing. So we built a very rough website and then sat down with those people we'd interviewed originally and said, We'll go away for 10 minutes, just look at the website, do what you like. And that was great because we'd leave them alone for 10 minutes and we'd come back and we'd say, well, what did you look at? And they kept, you know, telling us all these different stories that gave us so much insight into who they were as users and whether the information they wanted was accessible. And then we could follow up and ask them, well, you know, if you didn't find what you were looking for, why not? We clearly didn't make it obvious enough. So that helped us to um, keep developing this. And we did this as a sort of iterative process, uh, which gave us um, a sort of gentle, you know, this gentle introduction website that was a really great prototype for us and allowed us to come back to Geoscience Australia and say, you know, we want to work more on this education and this outreach stuff because it's what's really important. So we learned a lot from engaging with our users. Um, you know, I was super new to experience, uh, user experience design and it's now pretty much all I want to read about all the time. Um, and doing that direct connection actually helped us identify that the reason people weren't using the thing that we were building is because it was too hard and that we needed to address the gap in the learning curve first before they would really do that and that was the most valuable use of our time. We were able to define those different user groups and serve them different information 
And through that iterative process, we've started to really build something that's genuinely useful. Thank you. And next, also from Frontier SI, we have Chris Morgan, and he's going to be talking about how Frontier SI approaches agile development for GS Basher. Hi, everybody. So I wanted to really just talk about our journey going down an agile transformation at Frontier SI. So we started as a uh, collaborative research center for spatial information, which ran about 14 years. And so that came towards the end of that program, but our partners wanted to continue doing that kind of work, trying to bring government, industry, and research together to solve spatial problems. So not Frontier Size form over the last two years, and we're a non-for-profit with about 30 employees. Our project management, um, based on the way that they were doing it, was mostly waterfall delivery. So it had about one to two people per project, often mo multiple projects per person, running about six to 18 months per project. And there's a lot of changing priorities for these projects. So depending on how important something was, things were moving around a bit, as well as um, milestone and delivery based contracts. And so this was mostly because we'd moved from having government funding guaranteed to now having to have partner-based projects. So we were looking to lock in resources and have enough of that sustainability for our business. But there was a lot of interest from management to move some more toward an agile delivery for the different benefits that have been shown in some companies about moving to agile. So that's around in increased quality, customer focus, change, predictability, and, and things like this, which I have seen in larger organizations and volunteer programs I've been part of, have seen these benefits. But, okay, and to explain Agile a little bit, this is one way I like to, to talk about it, is you go from a traditional waterfall method is where you have, you do your analysis up front, then you do all your design, get that signed off, you build it, and then you test it. And that can be fine when it's a simple project, but when it's a little bit more complex, you, you, you tend to find issues in testing or even when you're building it, and it requires a lot of rework. So Agile is a little bit more about working out what are your most important features, breaking them down into slices, and then delivering on those ones, which can have a lot of benefits. So the question here was, how do we do Agile at Frontier SI? There's all these different methods and frameworks. There's Kanban, there's Scrum, there's Extreme Programming, there's Scale, there's Safe, there's all these different things. But we're trying to work through in, a, in this kind of case where we have researchers, we have developers, how do we find something that can work for everybody? So what we want to do is go back to the Agile principles. So you can Google these that come up under the Agile Manifesto, um, which I think are really useful um, to look kind of build, not just really based on a framework, but based on what you're actually trying to achieve behind these frameworks. So what we did is I spoke to the executive about, let's try and experiment with a couple of projects implementing some of these principles and see how we go. So the key things that we implemented was prioritization with stakeholders at the front of the project and then iteratively throughout the project. Regular cycles, depending on the project, can be one week, can be four weeks, it depends on the project. Then each of those cycles have reviews and showcases with those stakeholders and see how it's going, get feedback, plan for the next iteration based on that feedback. And then having retrospective is really important to go, what's going well, what isn't, what can we do about it? And actually doing that as a cycle, not at the end of the project, but right at the start. So, and then also company-wide showcases, really great for when you have multiple projects running, people will be across what everyone else is doing and highlighting that and getting that learning journey from there. So the results were from those projects, we had a really high custom satisfaction and the big thing was the visibility of the work and the transparency that, and the able to pr prioritize based on the results of those projects were really good. We also had really high staff satisfaction because they had a lot more ownership over the work that they're doing and they have a really clear priority about what they're working on. So we saw a lot of subsequent co um, contracts we had, removing a lot of milestones and making them a lot more vague because they were finding that it's actually quite restrictive to them when they can't change because you set a milestone and they need to go to their legal department and change the milestone and you're going around in circles. When you build that trust, they want to just have you work for a period of time because they know you can deliver for them. And so now we're implementing this pro um, these principles across all the next projects that we have. 
So it's only the start of the journey. We, we still want to try and move away from people having multiple projects at once. And we want to try and keep building this up and trying to build more teams around it. And it's a never ending thing, but I, I just really wanted to highlight that the principles behind Agile, I think are really good and there's something worth looking at and not always having to go down a framework for Agile because it's not always going to suit your needs at your company. Thank you. David, come to the stage, please. So next we have David Garcia, and he's going to be talking about how to map an island in the Pacific. Thank you. Okay, timer. I'm super nervous. Okay. Hello, everyone. Mabuhay at uh, Kia ora. I'm David. I make maps, and uh, it's nice to meet you. Uh, there will be some difficult topics here, so if you ever feel stressed, you know, just shake your hand and imagine the sea and feel the ocean and be the ocean. I'm a PhD student. I'm writing a story by living a life with OpenStreetMap and OSU and extension. How do I? Come on. Anyway, so there you go. I make nice maps. I should be writing the PhD, but <laughs> I, do the, I do this every day. Yes, QGIS, OpenStreetMap, and Blender. I really love it. It's so addictive. Uh, I, I come from this place, an island called, called the Philippines. Uh, and my experience with OSM was started with Typhoon Haiyan, basically. Um, we were using it to, to do urban planning, and we were doing mapathons, and it was good because the world was helping us. And if you were there uh, helping us, thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Uh, this is Tacloban, the city that was destroyed, and this was born before and after. And this is very useful until today. When I go back there, the maps are still there. Uh, part of my career was to go to a war zone next. Uh, ISIS was in the Philippines, and it's still there. And, and the government, they're still fighting, and there was a battle. And we did the same thing. This is a photo I took of the war zone, and, and I felt sad. I said, okay, I know nothing about GIS. So what to do? Uh, this time, I kind of stepped beside, uh, step aside and let the local communities lead, especially our Muslim experts and uh, sisters and brothers who know the city more than I do. That was OpenStreetMap on the base. We're doing participatory planning. The point here is, is it's not just important to democratize. It's important to diversify. And sometimes it's not me who has to make the map. Sometimes I just have to listen. And then we're doing some side projects. Uh, this, this whole story, but basically we're uh, mapping human rights violations in the Philippines. I was, I was using QJS. It's a sad story, still ongoing. I left the Philippines because of this, because it's very dangerous to be a researcher there right now. So I went to New Zealand. <laughs> and so thank, thank you, Aotearoa, for the scholarship. And, but, but the sad fact was, while I was doing the PhD, you know, that thing happened in Christchurch. And that made me think a lot about things in life. And uh, it happened close to my home. And I said, OK, what? What, what do I do now? So I traveled a bit. I went to Oxford for a seminar. And then it was nice because there was uh, an exhibit about, about maps. Uh, this was in last July. And I was very happy because I saw this. This is uh, a map of, of our Pacific ancestors in the Pacific. Uh, stick charts, the islands and, and the waves. And it's very nice because uh, at least I saw it uh, for the first time. And, and I love it. It's a map. It's our uh, ancient knowledge. Uh, but the sad part was the decoration was bad. So that was good. It was there. Everyone can see it. But uh, it said there at the description, Pacific mapping traditions declined in response to colonization. And I was, well, I don't know. It was because of, not just in response of. So it's not just the data, the mapping, or the participation that matters. How we tell the story about the mapping matters too. Uh, and then kind of, OK, what's the context of my research? Well, you know, it's a sad history of the Pacific. Uh, about, about the nuclear attacks and the colonization and all of that, and it's still happening right now with the island split and all that sad history, very difficult conversations. And I think, okay, how can we move forward as, you know, as one community? And despite this, uh, we have a future together uh, because everyone is very interested in the Pacific right now, apparently. Uh, but we have a shared future because we have a common past, especially for my Pacific brothers and sisters. I didn't know that the Say, navigators came from Southeast Asia. That part wasn't even taught to us in the Philippines. Because when I came to Aotearoa, the words are the same about the land, the sky, the, the islands. I mean, this, is, this is amazing. It's kind of a, so knowing who you are again. And that's what we're doing here uh, in one boat uh, and trying to remember things. So, if you look back, uh, OSM is about three things, at least for me. Missing maps, missing mappers, and the missing map stories. And the thing that I'd like to contribute to is, for example, the, the missing maps. Please go uh, on Friday. By the way, we're going to have a mapathon. I'm going to make more maps, one map every day, I hope, of an island. 
Um, I contribute to OSM by tracing reefs. I really love this. I trace roofs and reefs almost every day. And apparently there's so many reefs in the Pacific that haven't been traced yet, even back home in the Philippines. Uh, there's, a, there's a map on Friday. Please be there. We're going to talk about these things, how to collaborate. Uh, and also the missing map makers. Someone created this account <laughs> after the Heidelberg conference, the missing mappers. So what do we do with this? <laughs> and then I'd like to, I also like telling stories about uh, cartographers who were forgotten, like the legend Marie Tarp. Uh, she mapped the seafloor. And I, she's my inspiration, by the way. OK, my time is almost done. And the missing map stories. Uh, because mapping is a very social technical thing. It's social and technical at the same time. I'd like to help with the podcast. So I, I devote one day every week. Be my guest, and let's share stories about OSM. Thank you very much, and please remember. These guys are too good. They're, they're to time. I can't yell at them. Uh, so next up, we have Ewan Hill, and he's talking about mapping in the year of indigenous languages. Thank you to uh, everyone here today and uh, we're on the lands of a whole lot of tribes who've uh, come here and I won't mention them all. My mountain is Mount Dandenong, my river is the Yarra River, my boat is normally an A380, <laughs> my family are from Victoria but my family also come from Scotland and Auckland, so apologies for that. <laughs> my town is Richmond and my name's Ewan. Bruce Pascoe, who's read, written this book, and it's a, a book that I think every Australian should, uh, should read, um, says, to learn your country, start by learning the Aboriginal names. Uh, they show how deeply and how uh, intimately how old people knew the land. And it's really, really important that um, I feel that we need to capture all of this. On the right-hand side, there's a map which was on a, uh, the back of a spear chucker showing all of the water holes. It's really complex because some of them are permanent water holes, some of them are intermittent, and it showed the paths through there. This is, and this map, we don't know how old it is, but it, um, it certainly predates white man. So minus the numerals on there because it was taken from a, a book. We had 250 languages in Australia, about 800 dialects. Sadly, most of them are gone. The endangered ones are only spoken by um, some very few families. We lost a lot of uh, the First Nation uh, through a whole lot of diseases and through massacres. So we don't actually have a whole lot of information about a lot of the languages. So we've got 13 which are actually active in the community nowadays. This year is the International Year of Indigenous Languages and I'd like to point out uh, points three and five. Um, so uh, integrating Indigenous languages as a standard setting, um, so open street map, you can do that, and uh, elaborating new knowledge to foster growth and development. So it's something that we really need to capture. But wait, there's always a but. The first rule is um, the First Nation custodians, you, you need to talk to them um, straight up and really understand where they want to be. Some, some communities may want you to be part of it, some communities may not. Um, each one's different and you've got to spend a bit of time and respect and make sure that uh, uh, they've got a solid understanding of what you want to do. This is a fire which took four to six weeks, I think, to put out. Um, it's in a peat field. And uh, basically, we used several of those helicopters per day at about $200,000 a day. 
Uh, the local milk factory was closed. The aged care facility was closed. Um, we had to move people out of the uh, community. It was a really, really difficult fire because it was seven metres deep and uh, had 70, 76 hectares, give or take, and that was one of about four fires that were burning in peat. Really interesting, normally when you're fighting a fire, you have a safety officer, and a safety officer can just say, stop everything, and uh, you have to adhere to that. We actually had a senior elder who could actually say, stop everything. We don't, you can't go on beyond this point. So what we did was we had um, we had fifty square meter grid squares, and we actually made them uh, mark the um, the areas that uh, we shouldn't go into. In the end, we built a four kilometer pipeline. So what can you do? Uh, understand your locals, OSM. Uh, feel proud that uh, you're actually trying to keep something going. Got to make sure the legislation, there's a whole lot of legislation in Australia, federal, state and local. And this is all we've got of Aboriginal uh, names in uh, OSM. Just a quick one. This is uh, from Wellington in 1869. And if you had a look at the, uh, the first tile, we had six uh, names of uh, communities. We've only got one there, so not everything is correct. Thank you. Thanks, Ewan. Next, we have Hamish, and he's going to be talking about QGIS and geometry generators. Hello. We all know what QGIS is. Good. Okay. Right. Does everyone know what a, ge a geometry generator is? No. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> it's a symbol type that generates new symbols um, as subsymbols, um, which is which is pretty cool. So, um, so um, my name's Hamish, and I like to make maps. But unfortunately, I don't have the cartographic eye that uh, that David or um, or or, um, or Chris do to make really pretty maps. Um, but I do have the hacker's eye for looking at a feature and wondering how it can be um, uh, manipulated in maybe unexpected ways. So. Um, might talk about that briefly today. Um, <clears throat> so if you go to QGIS and you load up any layer and you go to the symbology tab, um, you um, find the little menu thing and go down, you'll find a row that says geometry generator. Um, and what it does is take the, the, the data that you've got in that layer and then you can run a bunch of uh, code. There's sort of a nice little DSL there, like a domain specific language um, that you can use. Um, and you can use that to create a new symbolizer that uses the modified geometry or a completely new geometry, um, which is cool because it means that you can keep your core data, your base data, separate from um, the rendered data that you want to display, uh, which is a really neat feature and I think more people um, should use it. Um, <coughs> so just a really simple example. Um, hey, it's some dots. Um, so we can go into our ge geometry generator. I've said that a few times this, uh, this talk, but... Um, uh, you can go, um, I want a polygon, I want it to be the buffer of the geometry um, for some number of meters, um, and the output is that. Um, so we're rendering polygons um, instead of points. Hey, I could have just you know, buffered that. Um, I could have just uh, used a really big symbol for that, right? Um, but that gets the, you know, the idea across. What if we're a little bit, um, what if we're thinking a bit more? Well, we could uh, make a geometry generator from those points. Um, we could create a line from the geometry, which is the point, to the current canvas cursor point, um, and we'll diff it to the uh, a circle around the canvas point. Um, and now we're generating this. Um, and it changes as you move around the map. Um, I don't know if this is a good idea, <laughs> um, but it's fun. All right. Um, things come out. Um, here's some lines, right? That's pretty straightforward. Um, what if we create a geometry generator that uh, does this little thing, this, um, this array for each plus generate series? It's basically a for loop. Um, it uh, interpolates the lines into a bunch of points, 
Um, and then let's add some randomization to each point and then render that out as a line again. Hey, we've got a wobbly line. That's pretty cool. So now we can do like some more sort of human styles. Um, we could then go and like maybe stack a bunch and it looks like a, you know something that you've drawn or some lightning or something. That looks pretty cool as well. So there's some really cool things you can do with that and the, uh, and the, um, the, uh, the language can be pushed pretty far. So what if we take those same lines again? Um, what are we doing here? We're creating, we're breaking it up to each basically bend in the line. We're making a new line that's offset from the line. We're turning into a curve, we're offsetting it left to right, depending on which angle that line is. Um, and uh, then we'll put an arrow on it. Hey, cool. We can put little directional arrows around our lines. Um, we haven't created any new data. It's still just the lines that are set. We've got a bunch of geometries on top. Um, so that's pretty cool. This is my favorite hack. I love this hack. Um, let's create an empty polygon scratch layer. There is no data here. Um, we'll use some base data. So let's take a raster data set of uh, New Zealand elevation, uh, New Zealand um, elevation model. All right. So inverted polygon on an empty polygon layer will create one feature. Let's iterate x's and y's over our map and query the raster layer for each point and then use that to create point symbols. Now we can create a vector layer from an empty scratch layer using the data from the raster layers underneath to do um, this kind of like fake elevation layer. Um, that's pretty cool. You can start doing more creative things like, hey, let's make it look like a, um, an equalizer graph over the whole of New Zealand. Again, there's, there's, that's an empty geometry. There's no geometries there. Um, yeah. So cool, that's it, thank you very much. Um, yeah. Thanks Hamish. Jessica. So Jessica's gonna be talking about an open source framework to map litter on the beach. Hi guys, so I'm Jessica. So in the last couple of days, I felt like a little spy coming all my way from Brazil to be in my first Phosphor G conference. And I'm really happy to be here and share with you what my colleagues and I, in, from different universities in South America, how we've been applying Phosphor G for beach litter monitoring. No. <laughs> so um, marine litter, it's a um, growing environmental concern, scenic pollution, entanglement of marine animals, and bioaccumulation of toxic substances are just some of the problems related to it. And beach litter monitoring is one of the first steps to better understand the problem so and help to map from uh, which polluting activities are most contributing to, the, to this problem. Different efforts around the world um, are, are coming to, to monitor it, and, and they are basically, they use basically uh, paper-based forms and no data standards, and uh, yeah, <laughs> and so you all, know where I'm going, lack of interoperability between uh, them and more time between field work and the final analysis. So we thought mm, maybe Phosphor-G can be helpful to make this process more efficient and, and still flexible. So yeah, this is what we came from, with what we came. We basically use three uh, different softwares, common ones, to do all the process. So QGIS to design the GIS project using common sampling designs for beach litter monitoring and having uh, questions that most groups tend to answer. And I've put this in a GIS collector, Keyfield, 
collect the data, and, and then the data is already structured to be read in an R environment and with the, um, with the R code that we built for it. So, and we apply it in three different beaches in the south part of Brazil. And so going for the first step in QGIS, uh, the project is basically one base map and one point layer with 11 types of attributes, which uh, are common attributes used for in paper-based forms. Different with get types allows us to con to use different uh, data formats, so the user have the the have access to the to the little list, and he can also or she uh, attach geotag images along the the um, monitoring. So here, what it looks like in the field. The result of it, it's a shape file already structured and ready to be read in uh, an our environment. And yeah, it's uh, not a complicated code. And in the end, we come with six different products, which help us to understand better the litter patterns and answer common questions. So the first pro products are related to um, general uh, litter items. So which uh, polluting activity contributed more in different beaches. And the third product is related to temporal um, changes along these beaches. And the fourth and fifth, so is related to spatial distribution. Are these items being accumulated in some specific zones along the beaches? And the last one is a map, which can be, be shared and help also to understand better the problem. So in the end, the conclusion was that it was pretty efficient, much easier than use paper-based forms. The data was already structured, and we got really excited with it. But we still have many problems. We had problems with the geotag images. And we think that a shiny app can help us to make it more, make it prettier, and most people, more people can use it. And yeah, if you want to talk about it, just find me or in the conference or yeah, in the media, in social media. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Next, we have Jolie. And he's going to be talking about Papua New Guinea and its isolation. So take it away, Jolly. Thank you. Good uh, afternoon, all. Um, I would like to talk about the giants of isolation in Papua New Guinea, not only in Papua New Guinea, but for small island developing states. Uh, small island developing states, as uh, defined by the United uh, Nations Development Program, says that a uh, um, distinct group of developing countries facing um, social, economic, and environmental vulnerabilities, disasters and all. Um, these are some of the giants that we have to, to overcome, that we need to, to um, defeat in some way or the other uh, in order for us to, to, to progress. I'll highlight some of them uh, during the course of the presentation. The date, um, UN member countries with 13 Pacific uh, Island countries, PNG is one of them, Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, and you name it. Um, Fifteen priority, priority areas, ha as um, highlighted by the uh, Barbados Strategy of Action in 1994. Uh, the, the red one that I highlighted there um, simply says that regional institutions and technical corporations, that's why we are here. Um, we need um, more vibrant, dynamic, regional um, uh, collaboration. And, and, and also the dissemination of uh, knowledge, technical know-how to small island developing states. Uh, th that's what uh, we need to do. Now, looking at the giants of um, isolation, one of them is languages. In Fiji, we have three languages and 300 plus dialects. Um, in Papua New Guinea, we have 800 plus languages and uh, dialects as well, according to the uh, uh, survey. Uh, the, uh, diverse cultures and traditions, very beautiful cultures and, and, and traditions, which uh, 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 we embrace and defines our way of living. 
uh, rugged uh, geographic and topographic attributes, very, very rugged terrain. We cannot um, move easily from one place to the other. Either you access canoe or you walk uh, to reach one point or the other. Small domestic markets and heavy dependence on few external remote markets and infant communication network. I would not say disconnected uh, communication network. We are connected, but only it, at its infancy stage. We are still developing. Simply, we are small island of Philippine states. Looking at the languages as a giant, uh, in order to, to, to come up with disaster risk reduction, languages can be a barrier for dissemination of information. Um, if we take it from a positive note, looking at languages, we cannot um, eliminate languages. We just have to embrace it, because it defines our culture. It defines us. It defines our values as well. Um, the one way we, in which we can overcome that is using open source mapping, um, so that people, uh, not only educated people, but the local, the uneducated, can see the maps and know where they are, their vulnerabilities for what disaster that they are vulnerable of. These are the uh, giants that I uh, highlighted, the diverse cultures, and the way in which we can address them. Um, looking at the number three, rugged geographic and topographic attributes, we, we, we need a remote sensing uh, uh, a knowledge in which we can do uh, analysis of our environment, especially we have uh, raw materials like um, mining, uh, minerals, and other uh, materials that uh, boost our economies. Um, we need communication and connectivity as well as capacity building. So just to end with this, don't think outside the box, just think, that, uh, just think like there is no box. Okay, thank you very much. And now we have Kamsin Raju talking about some of the difficulties you encounter mapping informal settlements. Hi, good evening. I'm Kamshin. <clears throat> um, so I work for UN Habitat in Fiji for informal settlements. Uh, informal settlements, a lot of people get confused with informal settlements, quarters, and uh, slums. But informal settlements just means that they have some permission to live on their land, but they don't have legal titles or leases or any of those things. So UN Habitat has identified 16 informal settlements in Fiji. We have like 280-something, but we've only been working with 16. I work with the Nandi settlements, uh, namely Korodiri and Nawaiji Kuma. And what we plan to do is, because these settlements are affected by climate change, we plan to map out the communities and then decide if we can help them adapt or if we need to relocate them. So, some issues that I've come across with <laughs> using open source software or data is the first one. QGIS crashes at the most random times, like my screenshot here. Look at how many layers I have, just like points of four cities and one base layer, and it still crashed. Next, I have, okay, GPS inaccuracies. Um, so I tried to use GPSs, I tried to use phone GPSs, I tried to pin points uh, using Google Earth on my map, but you see all these points where the houses are, the red dots and the blue dots, they're also varied. So um, using, sorry, using Q field as well, like Jessica had mentioned, that gives you high levels of inaccuracy as well. I've talked to her about it. <laughs> <laughs> Next, um, access to local open data sources. Okay, um, so in Fiji, we have a few data sources such as PacGeo, PacCrest, and Vanua GIS. Vanua GIS is not completely open. We need to get permission from lands to use it. But if you see the top image, that's PacGeo, and I searched the term Nandi, which is my town, 
and seven results came up upon which only one of them was relatively useful and that's it. Whereas when I search for Wellington has like Wellington City Council, links, um, you know all of them available, I won't list it down. But this is just one example of how many like types of information is available for one city. And I looked at links and they had about 2,000 plus data records for just Wellington, which is amazing because I have seven. <laughs> um, next, um, poor base maps or unmapped areas. I'm sure you're going to tell me that my job is to map the specific areas, but all I'm trying to say is, dude, there's no reference points. Look at my map for Nandi and look at the map for Wellington. Look at the difference of how mapped and unmapped the both, both the towns are. And my final point is, as you've noticed throughout my whole presentation, they're very, very ugly maps. So my final point, and this is my final favorite ugly map, is because we have lack of local expertise. All the maps that I presented wasn't done by me. It was done by some of my colleagues. And this map, particularly, is done by one of my colleagues who has a master's in GIS. And this is what she made to show the inaccuracies for the GPS points. This. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now we have Michael and he's going to be talking about high performance map caching. Yep, the topic is high performance map cache generation at Manaki Fenway Landcare Research. I'm Michael Speth, your presenter in DevOps. Andrew Cowie is our cartographer and geospatial developer. I want to talk about a recent project where Andrew and I were tasked with increasing the performance of caching our maps. Manaki Fenway Informatics developed and operates several web map applications. Our mapping services rely heavily on WMTS. We cache the maps and store the caches in Berkeley databases, BDBs for short. Our map systems use MapServer and MapCache, Apache modules. The first uh, website above is ADA, also known as the Antarctic Data Analysis. Fraser Morgan is giving a presentation tomorrow at 11.15 at Thornton Seminar Center. Please go and find out more. The second site is our environment, and that provides New Zealand environmental data. The third is the SMAP online, and that provides New Zealand soil data. There are several other sites that use our mapping systems. And finally, the one that's underneath is our web map services, and that provides APIs for accessing a subset of our maps. Before starting the high performance project, we use a single virtual machine approach with all software installed with Puppet on the host VM. This slide just shows you the relevant components and complexity. Here's some statistics regarding our maps. Our maps consist of 92 BDBs and 280 layers, about 3.4 terabytes of data, and 920 million map tiles. We generally cache down to 12 zoom levels. Using our existing processes, updating the maps takes a long time. For the high performance project, we picked one of our web services to focus our efforts on, and that was SMAP Online. Since 2011, caching was conducted on-prem on a single VM. So it has 12 CPUs and 32 gigs of RAM. We update the data about twice per year, and the compute time takes eight days. So it's a long time. We thought an easy win would be to just scale up our hardware on a single VM. We used AWS and tried a few instance types, so C59.xl and C5D.18xl. This is certainly more expensive than running on-prem, so we needed to exercise caution when running the VMs. The C59.xl took 40 hours and about 90 US dollars, while the C5D.18xl took 30 hours and 136 US dollars. Processing went down from eight days to 30 hours, but now we're incurring a cost. We thought we could do better for both processing and, ho and uh, time for hosting our costs. Minaki Fenua is a partner with Nessie. So from our project's perspective, Nessie is a free resource. 
One node on Mahawika is equivalent to the C5.18 XL from AWS. Our mapping system is a bit complicated to get set up. Puppet manages the software installation, and Puppet isn't really going to work on the nodes, and either is running VMs on compute nodes. We initially thought about compiling the software and manually configuring that, but it's really a nightmare scenario. We posed this to Nessie uh, Consulting, and they came up with a much more elegant solution, containers. Nessie staff helped us to containerize our mapping system. But the build pipeline shows how the Singularity container is created. That's the top left. And also, uh, the bottom is showing how we run it on Nessie. Caching can easily be divided up by layer and type. This means that all the SMAP layers can be built at the same time. There is no requirement for communication between jobs and all jobs right to the file system. We ran into a few issues, both in the conversion and running of the Singularity jobs. Nesting Consulting with, was instrumental in helping us resolving these issues. They were great to work with, so I highly recommend their service if anyone needs to paralyze their jobs. We built our SMAP caches using 72 CPUs per job with 128 gigs of RAM. That's one full node on Mahuika. The process required 44 nodes, and the compute time was only three hours. That is about 64 times faster than our original system and 10 times faster than AWS. This now opens up the possibility of near real-time mapping updates and we're now looking at the same pipeline and architecture to create weekly updates of map caches from Sentinel data. And finally, um, here's some links for our web map sites, so please check them out when you have time. Thank you. Now we have Niall, and I'm very curious to see what he's talking about. It's titled, Merry Christmas, QGIS. Actually, it's titled, No Merry Christmas for QGIS. Oh, sorry. Or actually, or you could call it cross-cultural communication issues in a multinational open source project. So QGIS is a, a massive project. Like there's uh, community members from basically all around the globe. Um, if you kind of break down the numbers, there's like uh, about 150 developers over time have contributed, but that's only like a small, small, small part of the community because we've also got uh, the documentation team, uh, translators, local user groups, and then uh, like a whole raft of other people who are sort of integral members of that QGIS community. Um, and they're all from everywhere. So if we just look at developers, like taking a really narrow snapshot of that community again, uh, the kind of most active developers on GitHub, and you look at where they're from, we've got people from you know, Australia, from Oceania, from Asia, uh, Europeans, um, US, a lot of different places. And there's something in the way there. Um, but as well as like geographically diverse, it's also sort of diverse in terms of people's backgrounds. So if we take one of the like oldest files in QGIS, it actually starts with this header that's got a whole bunch of Bible verses there. Um, but in the same project, we've also got people who've added like a commit like this and added this sort of Pastafarian religion logo, which is kind of like a joke religion. Um, right, so lots of different backgrounds, lots of different cultures. Uh, and it's, it's raised some kind of interesting discussions over the time, conflict and issues and that sort of stuff. Um, so today I'm actually going to be cheating and I'm going to air some of this dirty laundry about what happens behind the scenes in the, the QGIS project with some examples. First example. All right, so this is from uh, the QGIS Hackfest that occurred recently in Bucharest. Um, actually, it's not a QGIS Hackfest anymore because we changed the name to QGIS Contributors Meeting because Hackfest was, uh, it was actually turning people away and it was really difficult for people to get management approval to send their employees to a Hackfest. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Anyway, you know, lots of fun. Um, midway through, this pull request came in uh, to update the pull request template on GitHub to add that line. You can imagine kind of the background of what was happening over there at the time. Um, got merged, right? About a couple of days later, this pull request came in to say, hey, hang on a sec, let's think about this. You know, some cultures uh, totally reject alcohol consumption and we should be respectful for that. What are we actually, what message are we portraying by adding that to our sort of public image? Um, and that one got merged. So, you know, <laughs> resolved. There was discussion all on those pages, lots of comments. Example two I want to show. 
Uh, this was in a massive period of transition for QGIS. So going from QGIS 2 to QGIS 3, heaps of work, like a really kind of stressful time for the developers and the project in general. Um, born out of this kind of frustration of like one of the developers hit these issues with uh, QGIS server. So QGIS server is like the server-based base of QGIS. Uh, speaking honestly, in QGIS 2, it was really quite shaky. It was kind of like this, basically. Um, and, you know, this developer kind of ran into an issue and his work got a whole lot more difficult because of QGIS server and he posted that thing to say, actually, let's just get rid of it um, as a thing. Um, but this kind of, this, this caused a lot of conflict because a lot of people were really invested in that emotionally in uh, financially. Um, and they're like, what are, you, what are you actually saying here? And your humor's not working. Um, the good news is out of that, that big kind of conflict, really positive result came because uh, people stepped up and invested a lot of money in. The QGIS project itself also invested money in. Server was ripped apart for QGIS free, rewritten from scratch, and now it's actually quite modern, and um, you should revisit it if you've got bad experiences. Number three, again, QGIS 2 to 3. Um, coming out of this like really difficult week of discussion, I thought, or somebody thought, um, yeah, it was me, uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> that I could be funny on the QGIS list and just post this stupid joke comment about, let's go to C++17 uh, as QGIS 3. Um, as a consequence, we lose the Windows builds. Who cares? Uh, OSX users will have to build their own version of the compiler from scratch. Yeah, they can do that. Um, I was like, yeah, that's a silly joke. Um, some people got it, some, some cultures, and they kind of ran with it. Uh, other people just took it literally. And um, it's like, you know, my, my users will never change their OS to, because of this. Uh, Fortunately, Nathan stepped in and saved the day and actually explained, that's Australian humor, it doesn't work for everybody. <laughs> right, example four. Um, at one stage, Q just had this little Easter egg. We're going into Christmas, somebody, somebody, uh, made it so it had like a Santa hat on the, the Q just logo. It was really well received. Um, people on Twitter loved it. You know, they said it made their day. It was really happy. Uh, then feedback started coming to say, actually, how do we get rid of this? You know, it doesn't, it doesn't match my culture. I want to get rid of it. Um, <laughs> We don't want it there, let's get rid of it. And yeah, the pull request came in, got merged, it got removed, got turned into a plugin, so you can still get your hat <laughs> for QGIS if, if you're part of a culture that wants that. Um, lastly, my story, right, for a long time, my experience with QGIS was these mailing lists, people's little avatar was all I knew about them, their GitHub picture, you know, their Twitter face, that was my whole knowledge of these developers. It wasn't until I met them face to face at a QGIS meeting and they became real people that that issue, like that, uh, my vision of them changed and I actually learned that their, you know, email's terrible. Internet's terrible for actually communicating who people are. Thank you. And now we have Richard Law. He's going to talk about how to create reproducible workflows with Docker. Uh, I'm third to last, by the way, so we're nearly there. We're up to the R's already. All right. Um, so we have a reproducibility <coughs> crisis, and I really mean a crisis. In November 2011, uh, the Center for Open Science launched the Reproducibility Project. Uh, it involved about 270 authors aiming to reproduce the studies of, uh, sorry, 100 uh, studies, and I think it was in the field of psychology, but it's not super relevant. Uh, originally, 97 of these studies uh, claimed to have significant results. The group of, of authors, 270 of them, went to massive lengths to reproduce these studies, consulting the original authors and their data sets. But only 35 of those studies were able to be replicated uh, in a way that reproduced the original result. Of those 35 replicable studies, the average effect was weaker than the original studies. And in some cases, the replicated study found results with the opposite effect to the one they were trying to recreate. So, Reproducibility is a foundational um, principle of the scientific method. It involves recording your method in detail so other people can do the same thing. Therefore, how we use computers to do science must consider how, uh, how to re reproduce our results on other people's computers. So I'm gonna share uh, a way that I work that uh, hopefully my analyses are reproducible by others and also by future versions of myself. So um, this is the high level view, we'll zoom in in a moment. Um, the general premise is that it starts at the top and comes out at the bottom. The bottom is things like uh, images, data sets, perhaps even an entire journal article if you're writing in LaTeX or something like that. Um, 
Making sure that your inputs is, are persistent is also important for reproducibility, but that's a different topic. So starting from the beginning, we uh, create this thing called a Docker image. What's a Docker image? Well, think of it like a detailed reproduction of a chemist's lab, right down to replicas of the, the beakers that they use to do their experiments. It assembles all the tools you need to do your experiment. In, in our case, that tends to be things like GDAL, um, you know, this example's got Rust Stereo, and a NetCDF um, as Python libraries. And it's important to be able to declare the exact version of these libraries uh, in case later on you discover maybe there was a bug in something that you used. Um, cool, so in this case we're actually uh, using a, a Docker image that someone else has made and extending it slightly. Next we use a related, a related tool called Docker Compose. Uh, and that essentially allows us to declare the interface with our computer, so where our data is sitting, uh, where the output should go, environmental, environment variables and things. And on the left we've got sort of a, a development configuration that you can use with, with you know, subsets of your data. And on the right we can override certain parts of the configuration for when we want to run data on the full set or, um, or write to a particular place where output should be written officially. Uh, next, uh, once we've defined uh, Docker Compose uh, context, we build the service. So we've got here a Docker Compose build model. And once it's been built, uh, we can run model. Cool, once it's running, we've got access to all our data in this reproducible environment. Uh, and this is where a new tool comes in called Make. Now Make's been around for a while, so it's not new, it's you know, new in this context. Um, <laughs> and what, how Make kind of works, again, this is a top to bottom kind of thing. If you start at the bottom, you define a target. So your target might be you know, the data set you want to produce. And each target can have uh, one or many um, to things that it depends on. So, and those dependencies are themselves targets which have dependencies and so on and so forth. It's essentially a big chain of dependencies starting from your raw data and processing down to some kind of final output. Um, cool, so uh, now we're actually already at the end. That was surprisingly quick introduction to Docker and Make. Um, so the big picture is that, um, if we think back to the beginning I talked about that the um, the reproducing those studies. If you go to that link in the bottom there, you can actually download an R script to the authors of that reproducibility study published, where you can reproduce the study that reproduced the studies, and uh, which is quite cool. But more importantly, um, it gives you so much more confidence about the output of that, right? Because you can actually go and, and run this analysis yourself. It's there in complete detail, warts and all. There's probably bugs in their code for all I know. Uh, and isn't that just great? Um, you know, it's, it's this, this philosophy of open, re reproducible science uh, built on the transparent foundation of open source software. And I think that's just awesome. So, thank you. Second to last, we have Rose Phillips, and she's going to be talking about pixels, point clouds, and geosource op uh, awesomeness. Yes, geo open source. <laughs> I'll let her take it away. Uh, kia ora everyone. Um, today I'm going to be talking about point clouds, pixels, and open source awesomeness, specifically how we use open source tools at Land Information New Zealand to pr process and publish our Creative Commons elevation data. Firstly, diving into the classified point clouds that we publish um, from LAS tools. Uh, LAS info is a great way to summarise information about our point cloud data, um, from finding the total number of ground points to finding the maximum scan angle found in that data. That's a really um, useful tool. Um, you can also use LAS Validate to check if your point clouds um, have any corrupt elements in them and also um, figure out if your point clouds follow the file specification that they were delivered in. We use these commands at Land Information New Zealand to cross-reference our point cloud data um, with a corresponding survey report and contracts to make sure what we've been delivered is what they, said, is what they told us, basically. 
Um, you can also use um, the Lice Zip tool to compress the point cloud files into um, up to eight times small, smaller file. So that's really useful if you want to transfer the data to someone else or just store it for your own means. Uh, PDAL is another great piece of um, open source LIDAR processing software. It has a really broad range of tools and applications. I'll just skim over these. Um, a, a, an example is you can translate from one point cloud format to another. Um, this software has the um, most complete set of um, point cloud file format drivers um, that are available through open source software. Um, you can also remove noise, you can identify ground points as well as splitting and merging point cloud data. Um, the PDAL, PDAL pipeline tool is um, a really savvy way to combine all the tools that are, that are available under this software. Um, into a single um, JSON reference. We use PDAL pipelines to reclassify our points if needed, changing our metadata headers, and to also add some information, specifically um, coordinate projection references. And at the same time doing this, um, we can also compress our point clouds. Um, finally, we publish our um, classified point cloud data through um, open topography. Um, one of the options um, when you're downloading um, this data is to view them through the 3D point cloud viewer. You can do some really cool um, operations with this viewer. You can generate cross sections, um, you can do volumetric analyses and also filter classifications all for free. Um, this has been built on the front end through Poetry Viewer and in the back end a Greyhound server with an Entwine library, all open source. To check out our point clouds, just Google search open topography and just click um, on the top of the web page, find the find data tab. Now diving into our eleva elevation rasters, which are derived from our um, classified point cloud data, we publish digital elevation models representing um, the ground level elevation, as you can see here. But, and um, we also publish the digital surface models representing the first terrain feature found at that pixel. Um, that is the first return minus noise. Um, we use GDAL, specifically GDAL Info, GDAL Edit, and GDAL Warp to inspect our raster data. That is a single batted gr gridded ASCII file or GTF file. We also use GDAL to change file formats, um, to change our node no data value if needed, and to mosaic our rasters together. We also use a Postgres um, database with a PostGIS extension and procedural language extension to verify that the raster tiles that we're given correspond to a 1 to 1,000 scale um, elevation reference. As we're given thousands and thousands of tiles and our references have, of reference has approximately a million attributes, um, processing them in a Postgres database is a very time efficient way to make sure our data is um, what we expect it to be. We also use Python with, with all these open source tools to combine um, elements together to create a nice GUI interface and in this specific context to make sure that the correct naming conventions have been used. That said, to download our raster LIDAR elevation data, our digital elevation or surface models, you can go to data.lens.gvt.nz. Um, to learn how to use some of these really cool open source tools and to do some pointy 3D exploration, um, you can check out these medium blogs that I've made. Um, to find these, you can just Google search point cloud medium L-I-N-Z and one of the first URLs is a link to all the blogs that are available under the Land Information New Zealand site. Thank you. And our last presentation, we have Wing Ho, and he's got the most technically difficult one to show, so hopefully it works. Um, he's going to be showing us how you can view web maps offline. Thanks, Sam. <coughs> cool. All right. Hi. Uh, last talk of the day. Good job for making it through. <laughs> Um, so I had a bunch of slides that I was going to go through. Uh, my name is Wing. I'm a front-end developer. I don't really do much work with Geospatial, although I do work with Terrier. We do Geospatial things there. Uh, and yeah, so I had a bunch of slides, but I think what I would do was uh, I'd start with my demo, actually, um, because otherwise you're going to get bored to death with all the slides before. So uh, well, a couple of things to note. 
I don't use Windows. This is a Windows machine. So uh, let's just see if this works. Because um, it worked on my machine. It's probably reproducible. Let's, uh, <laughs> thanks Richard. Um, so I have a map here. Um, and I'm just going to refresh that. Uh, okay, good. Error. It's first thing of that's great. Um, but <laughs> so it's it's a map. Um, it works. We're online, uh, and I'm just gonna try and what we're doing is uh, we're caching a couple of things. Not all of us have access to uh, high performance compute that we can use for free. So <laughs> so why not just load it up onto the user's browser? So all right. So I've just kind of. Use the app a little bit just because uh, we need to cache a bit of things. We're using the browser. Um, and hopefully, uh, I'm going to try and do the big thing. And we are uh, going to try and figure out how to use Windows. Uh, OK, here we go. So hopefully, you can all see that. I'm going to go to work offline. We're going to go offline. And, and as an extra precaution, I'm just going to turn off the Wi-Fi here. I hope I didn't disconnect anything. Uh, and if we refresh this map, it should just work. That's probably still fine. Error th same error. But let's let's see. Okay, so the map still kind of works. The tiles are still loading in, uh, and I can still go in and add whatever data set that I just loaded in. And yes, that is the play button. Some of these icons are missing. So yeah, that's all working offline. Um, and we were able to do that because we leveraged the user's browser um, and to kind of stuffed in all the tiles, stuffed in all the data. Uh, and that's done with JavaScript. So here's, I guess we can flick back to the, the stuff, the boring stuff. So uh, the <laughs> offline maps in the browser. So this is done with service workers. Uh, they're made available now in all the major browsers, including Safari and including IE. So that's props to them. <laughs> uh, why do you want it? so? <laughs> Things you can do is you can go offline uh, progressively and safely. So what I mean by progressively is that what I'm showing you here, if it doesn't work and or if your uh, user's browsers doesn't support service workers for whatever reason, it's just older version or um, they're working on an enterprise machine that has like a lockdown, really old version of Chrome or something, uh, it's still going to work. It's, it's um, You're not going to break anything by introducing what we're adding here. Uh, how do I get started? Um, we're using service workers to kind of control the cache on the client side. So you can kind of do this sort of thing on the browser, uh, sorry, uh, on the server side, but we're kind of just pulling that logic into the browser instead of the, the server. Uh, there's some techno mumbo jumbo here. We're, we're using, I'm not going to show you how to uh, install a service worker. I'm just going to show you what, how we leverage that to do the caching. Uh, basically, we add a whole bunch of files, like all the HTML, CSS, JavaScript that you use to load your uh, particular single page application. Uh, and then you kind of uh, hijack the fetch event, um, and you pull out stuff from the cache and feed it to the fetch. So the browser thinks it's online. It's like, oh, I'm going to request things as usual. Uh, and if it's not there, it's not made available, uh, then uh, it will just pull it out of the cache instead of going to the network. Um, but this way, you can kind of go to the network in the background while returning a, a cached tile or cached data set or cached something immediately. Uh, and then the user doesn't have to wait. And they'll still get the most re recent data on the next request because you're just kind of doing this, um, storing the cache first. Uh, uh, yeah, say, serving the cache, and then you get the network request for the next one. Uh, Webpack helps us do things. Um, if you're doing single page apps, uh, you're probably using Webpack. Um, there's a plugin that kind of wraps up all of this, what I'm explaining in, in a ni nice little package. Uh, and my time is almost up, so I'm just going to tell you about some other things, some other resources. Google and Mozilla have cool things so that you can do with service workers. Uh, and I've already shown the demo. Um, thanks. I'm also speaking here tomorrow morning, so I'm going to be talking about Google. Yeah. <laughs> the evil company.